Hello, and welcome to the Follow Along Game Project. The purpose of this is we're going to make a little game. Um, this is a programming assignment, uh, and we have... Uh, uh, so our goals are, are specific, <laughs> and they are not really to finish a game or make the game good or do lots of Unity flourishes like animation and visuals, because that we can do that later. We can worry about that. From a game design perspective, we're focused on code. So the real purpose of this project is the architecture is how do we organize plan and to create the systems of like an actual game that has multiple levels. Um, so this video is going to be your as a follow along video, you're going to you know, make this project with me. Uh, and we're, it's going to be in a number of different parts. Uh, part one, this one is going to be the player movement system and sort of the bones of the game, a little prototype uh, of playability but it is not yet a game. It's not going to have any UI. It's not going to have any of that stuff um, and not being able to switch levels. Part two is really the part we care about, which is when we take that little player movement and the basics and we start turning it into an actual game that's playable uh, where we have the, uh, uh, the player uh, 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 getting to the end of the level and then we go to the next level. So we need to have a list of levels somewhere. We have UI on the screen that gives the player feedback. Um, and that we manage all, all that stuff appropriately via code. Uh, and then part three will be an optional part where we uh, do a bunch of Unity stuff to make the game better, like make it pretty and give it camera shake and like stuff like that, uh, which is, it's good to know how to do, um, but that's more of a learning the Unity side of things, not necessarily learning the code architecture side of things. From the code side of things, a lot of that stuff, like playing a particle effect or a sound, it's just, it's calling a function. Um, uh, in the, the architecture side where we organize where all that behavior lies and who owns what and stuff that's uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about but uh, that's the plan uh, so the question is what game to make in the past we've done solitaire the solitaire is a game that uh, uh, you know there's no, it's not about a player moving around a scene using physics it's, it's like we have to do all the UI ourselves of picking up and putting down cards uh, so it's a really good challenge because it's so different from normal games and it's all of the ways that it's different is helpful. Um, and all the videos for the Solitaire follow-along project are still public and up, and you can use those, but um, we're not going to do it. Uh, uh, we're not going to do it for two reasons. One, it's a longer project, and I want this to be a little bit shorter and easier. Uh, but two, um, the uh, uh, I, I do actually kind of want this to be more of a, a, a what do you call it, more traditional game using physics and movement and stuff, um, just so we can get a little bit help, that could be helpful for the game design class that we're taking from currently. Um, you know, uh, it's fine. So uh, that's that's the plan. Let me tell you the pitch for the game. Let me tell you the pitch for the game. Let me open up. It's called Wall Slammer Escape. Uh, that's my pitch. Um, and the, the game is you're going to be some kind of I think maybe bug is kind of how I want to theme it. Maybe you're like some animal, like a rhino or something in a zoo. Uh, but your goal is to get out of a level. You're going to be in some static level and, and you want to get out. You want to get to some exit. Exit. Just drawing on the screen here. Uh, and there are going to be, and you're yellow. You're this guy. Hello. Uh, you want to get out, but everything, all these pink obstacles are going to be getting in your way. Right? Maybe there's a wall here. Maybe there's a wall here. Maybe there's a wall here. Right, uh, and when you move, when you move, you can't just go like, oh, I'm gonna go to the exit. Uh -huh. um, when you move, you, you can only move in the four directions, the cardinal directions, uh, north, south, east, west, up, down, left, right. Uh, and when you move, you have to move as far as you can until you hit a wall and then you stop. So it's like everything's ice underneath you. Uh, mechanically, I think you're just like, like that's why I like the idea of bug, like a, like a grasshopper just shoots itself in a direction that's just like, it's trapped in this small area and it can't like control its movement very well. Or rhino is just angry and in charge mode or, uh, uh, I don't know, the theming we can figure out later. Um, I kind of like bugs. I like the, uh, the scale that that gives us in terms of like designing graphics and stuff. We can make, you know, little things be big and it's fun to play with scale. Um, so you're, but uh, every time you hit a wall, which basically means every time you move, uh, every time you hit a wall, you're gonna, you know, slamming in your, your face into it, uh, and that's going to take away a bit of health. Uh, and every level is going to have a certain amount of health, uh, and then you got to get to your exit, but you have a limited number of moves to do so. So in this case, um, in this case, you could just do that. <laughs> uh, uh, 
but you know, maybe there's a, a trick where you have to like go like that, right? There's like this proxy or something. Um, uh, so that's the plan. Uh, let's get started. Um, so let's make a to do list. To do. Uh, I got a little notes file, a little to do board here. Uh, let's. We need our player movement script. That's not a very good to do. It's pretty loose. Uh, but we need to input to movement. Um, we're gonna need pickups, which are gonna be our health pickups. I think maybe like a hat or a helmet. If you're flying by and you pick one up and then you hit the wall and then it pops off, but you don't lose any health. Uh, so I'm gonna call that a pickup. Uh, and then we're gonna get a, what do we call it? What do we need? Um, a, a level end. So those aren't pickups, those are, it's still something that you go over, but it's like where you end on. Um, so some kind of floor space that details where you are. Uh, maybe we want lava or water or whatever pit that you can fall into and die. Um, this is going to be kind of more of a puzzle game than an action game. So there's no timer or anything. So, you know, the, the choice to just move right and go into lava, you know you've lost. Okay. Uh, we need a level manager to go uh, to go between levels and to keep our track, track of all of them. Uh, and we need a, a level design. We need to figure out how we're going to make the level. That's what we're going to start with. Um, so I've got a new, I got, I'm in Unity 2021.2, uh, uh, but like whatever. Uh, and we are going to make a new, um, uh, what am I saying? We're going to make a, a new 2D template and go from there. So in progress, let's start with our level design. Let's start with our level design. We're going to use the 2D um tile map feature built into Unity to draw out our levels. And that will allow us to later when we want to do art, which is not really in the scope of this video, because uh, we're going to try to focus on the just the code parts of things. Um, but I think it's worth going over the um, uh, this stuff, because it's fun. So in underneath window 2D, uh, and if you don't see this package, you probably opened the 3D template. You can either, if it's a brand new project, you might as well delete it and make a new one. But if you don't feel like watching Unity load, uh, you can go to your package manager and you can uh, uh, add the, the 2D features. Um, the one we care about is the tile map, uh, tile map editor. Do we need the extras? I don't know. So, uh, and probably we need all that stuff probably. But um, if you open up the 2D template, you'll have all of these features. You'll have this tile map feature, but you, if you're in a 3D project, you won't see that. Um, so, uh, let's make a new folder, call it tiles. We're just going to get ahead of that. And then I'm going to make a new palette. I have this tile, tile palette open. I'm going to create a new palette. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, a sort of when we, we're going to be able to draw our level in a grid of squares. Uh, so, I'm going to make a new palette. I'm just going to call it palette. We're only going to have one. It's going to be this one. Uh, create. And it's going to ask me where to save it. And ah, because I knew that was coming, I have a folder. Otherwise, you can just make one now and uh, we'll save it in here. So now inside of my tiles, I have this weird object thing. It's, uh, uh, a pre, uh, it's called a, pre, it's a prefab, but it's a, uh, uh, it's a palette. All right. Um, drag tile sprite or sprite texture assets here. So let's make a new, another new folder and let's call it sprites. Uh, and now here's where all of our art can go, uh, but we're going to make a square. <laughs> Some really fancy art for us. Uh, so in the, you can make squares in, and it looks the same in your hierarchy, but we want to be in the project window. And we want to make a 2D sprites square. square. Um, we can call that square. We don't need to give that the name player or wall or anything because it's, it's, it's a square. <laughs> So uh, this is the this is actual this dot PNG file. Unity made a like a four pixel or how, hold on how, what, what is the new version? I feel like they changed it. Sprites two kilobytes. It can it can't be much. Uh, two fifty six by two fifty six. It's plenty for a white square. We don't need that many pixels. <laughs> okay. Um, 
but we can pretty easily swap this with any other art assets we got. Uh, let's drag this into our tile map. Ooh, ooh, now things are making sense. And it's gonna ask us to save our tile asset. And we're just gonna go to tiles and call it square for now. Um, but here we go, we have our image and we have a tile asset that is connected to that image. And they both look like white squares because it's the same sprite. Um, so the tile asset is a sprite and a location and it lives inside of a tile map. Our tile palette is a set of tiles that we can paint with um, onto a tile map. So all we need to do is create a tile map. This is the thing that's actually in our hierarchy. Right click 2D tile map rectangular and uh, there we go. So now our grid changed, our world's grid changed, right? We have this normal world grid. We click on the tile map. Uh, we have a grid component and we have a tile map component um, as a child of the grid. Uh, this is actually, I've used the grid without the tile map plenty of times, just so like it's got some useful functions of just like setting down a grid in grid based games, but if you don't need the tile map. Um, but in the tile map, uh, with it selected, and you can have multiple of them, we can cl click on an object that'll give us a little paintbrush tool and we can draw tiles. And there's not 8 million square game object prefabs in our hierarchy that we can move around one by one. We can erase them very easily. Uh, we can do all, all, it's just like, you know, if you're making a 2D game, uh, it's a nice way to work. Our level. Uh, oops, that's not the right PB for that. Uh, there we go. We'll put so we'll put a couple out in the wrong spots. Okay. Um, this is our level. Um, so so we could have made this with game objects. We could have dragged squares around, but having the tile map, being able to paint, add, e easily edit. I'm gonna pause recording while the garbage truck goes gets things. Background noise is gone. Okay, uh, that's almost everything we care about with the tile map. So we make new wall assets. We make a wall facing left, a wall facing up, a wall facing right, a wall facing down. We drag them in as tiles here. We can paint, we can add add whatever we want. Um, we can extend the tile map and make, turn these things into code. We can have them change their sprite depending on their neighbors and make them automatically face the right way and do all sorts of crazy fancy things because we can do whatever we want because it's unity. We can break it all apart and extend it how we like, but we can also just use it to paint squares easily. And that's good. So uh, let's go back to our drawing, our grab tool, which is will keep us sane as we try to do other things. Um, okay, so there's our there's our level. That's it, right? That's it. It's not, not super complicated. Uh, so let's go to our to-do Delete that and move on to our player movement. So to have player movement, we need a player. Player is going to be a square, uh, but that's no good. So let's give them a, a color. Let's make them buggy green. Right? What does the game look like? Background color is no good. Main camera, background, desaturate that. This already looks bad. Okay, let's go to our player, player. Okay, we got a sprite renderer game object. Don't worry about the background color, whatever. We got a sprite renderer on it. Uh, first thing I notice is the player is not like snapped to the grid. How do we how do we position them precisely? Well, if I position them at zero, zero, you'll notice I'm right in the center point. But when I draw, I draw and the origin of every square is like the bottom left corner, but the origin of my player sprites the center. So my positions all either need to be like in multiples of 0.5 in order to be lined up with the grid. Um, uh, so we are gonna turn on snapping. This is grayed, my grid is grayed out. Uh, uh, grid snapping on and off. It is, if we hover over it, the tooltip gives us a little bit of help. It's available when I set tool handle rotation to global. Okay, well that's over here, tool handle position and rotation, uh, global. Oh, we should have an object selected. Well, wait, what? 
this because I'm in the thing? What am I, what, what, what? Does this need to be on please? Green, right here. I'm going crazy. Okay, now I have it. What did I just do? I just like, I clicked away. I deselected everything. And then I came back. All right, well now I can grab the player and I can move him around and change my snap increment to 0 0.5. Then I should be able to move them. Uh, and yeah, I could put them on the half positions, but you know, it's close enough. It's good enough to like quickly slop them and slap it, slop, slap, slot them into into place. Uh, and we could write a little script that just snaps the player to, <laughs> to positions. <clears throat> anyway, let's move on um, to uh, our player movement script. So let's make a new folder for our script so we can stay organized. And hey, look at that. We're 15 minutes into this video and we're finally starting to write the code. Uh, let's make player movement. Uh, and we're going to make player input. There we go. Thank you. And let's open that up. All right. First. Things first, let's get a new color theme for writer. Oh, no, dark theme, dark theme, dark theme, flash window. Right color. Nope, 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 too bright. Ooh. Okay, we got a new color theme. Oh, no, those comments aren't going to show up. Oh, this isn't important. This was just like a joke. Why uh, do I have bad themes? <laughs> Why is it green? Uh, more con, more contrast for the video. To come up. Okay. Great. Uh, whatever. So, player movement. Player movement. How are we going to move? How are we going to move our player? We're going to write a function called move that is going to move our player. <laughs> and we're going to move up and move up, right, left, down. Uh, so we're going to be given a vector 2, uh, but we can only move in the cardinal direction. So let's use a vector 2 int. Ooh, what's a vector 2 int? Well, a vector 2 int is like a vector 2, but instead of storing the XYZ, the XY properties as floats, they store it as uh, integers. And they are they can't do a lot of things like dot products and cross products and stuff. But we will know that our we don't have to worry about uh, floating point comparisons. Our you know I won't have zero point three 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 four and zero point three 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 two and not be equal. Um, so let's take a direction and then we'll move in direction. Okay. Hey, let's go to the player input script and get that one working. <laughs> and uh, we made a function called move. We made it public. It's on a player movement script. Player input is going to store a reference to this other component that it has. Player movement underscore movement. Private and private. We can initialize that or in start. That's fine. Or in awake, I mean. Wake happens before start. They both happen at the beginning. Great. Uh, if input dot get. Do I want to set up buttons? Nah. We'll just do keys for now. Key code dot arrow keys or WASD. How about W or input dot get key down key code dot up arrow. Uh, this should be get key down. Hey, this is why we use input systems, because writing this out by hand is a pain in the butt. Underscore movement dot. Now we can access the move function contained in the player movement script that is on that other component. This should start to feel a little familiar at this point. If you're in this, if you were at the point where we're doing this project, we have done this ourselves. We have done some code challenges involving 
accessing functions on other components. This should, this should feel like a pattern that we're just going to be doing a lot. I'm going to reference a component. I'm going to get its a reference to it with get component. I'm going to use it inside of some logic. Hey, that's like that's like that's like a lot of the code we write. It's just going to look like this. It doesn't it doesn't get more complicated. This is fine. We'd want to change this input code to be something a little bit more flexible that we could change in the future. Maybe store our key codes and and serialized functions so we can edit that ourselves. Uh, but this takes a vector two int of up. Let's copy and do it again with S and down arrow. And we do down. And you guessed what's happening next. Uh, a and D. That would be left air, left apple, left arrow, and right arrow, and that would be A and left is left, D and D and right, no, uh, yeah, D and right is right. Uh, so what happens if you push two keys down to the same frame? Well, in this case, it will prefer up movement, uh, up and down movement before doing left and right movement or it'll before up, before it does down, before it does left, before it does right. But because we're only checking that key down, it's very rare that we're gonna be like hitting both at exactly the same time. So that I think is a fine bug to have um, instead of seeing if there's multiple of them and then just not moving or trying to do both or who knows. Um, so that's our, there's our code. Right, look how, oh, a big chain of if, else, if, else, if, else, if. Don't love that. That's why we kind of hide it all over here in the uh, player input script. And now we can go back to player movement and actually worry about the main challenge that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main challenge that we have is we need our player to move and we need them to move. Once they start moving, they move all on their own. <laughs> uh, so there's two ways to do that. There's two ways to do it. So we are players here. Our wall is there. And we're on a grid that could have some pickup item on any of these spots in the grid. And we, when we move right, we need to go do, 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 do. Hit right. Question number one. Are we going to move instantly and basically teleport to this position? Or are we going to move one at a time? Or are we going to slide? I actually like teleporting instantly. Uh, I think that's going to make the game feel good. It's going to be like, bam. Uh, but it won't feel good if we just teleport. It won't feel good if we like leave dust trails as like a, a behind us. Uh, so we want to... Uh, 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 I think I want to instantly snap us here and then and then have us be there. Um, we need to check every single position that we move along and leave a dust trail maybe and check to see if there's a pickup item that we grabbed along the way that changed our, our status. Um, so, th so the ways we can move this, one is we could just move one square at a time and see if we hit, see if we can move in the next direction. If we can't, we just, we just keep, we just repeat and we like do like a loop uh, that goes until it's broken by hitting the wall. Two, we could like ray cast out and find our final position and then move us there by like hitting this point and then finding that point. And then once we have our final position, we say, okay, well, let's check if there's anything, any pickup items along the way and let's check, uh, let's, let's, calculate what all these different points are, which would be pretty easy. You just, you look at the start and end points and loop, uh, loop the number of times that that distance is. And, uh, uh, and it, would, it would be easy. It sounds complicated to explain, but it would be easy. Um, uh, and check for pickups and, and spawn industrials. Um, we're going to do this lower one uh, because I think it's a fun way to explain recursive functions, uh, which is neat. Um, and it makes the checking for pickups and spawning dust trails or whatever very easy. So uh, we're going to move once, move once, move once, move once, move once, move once until we hit something and then we're going to stop. And all of that code is going to happen 
Like, it's not going to happen once a frame. Uh, it's just going to happen, like, it's just going to propagate and happen. It's going to make more sense when I show you the code. Okay. Uh, so, let's do, let's do it. So, we have a move, which is going to start everything off. Uh, I'm going to leave that function alone, and we're going to write, we're going to write a little move once. And then we're going to make it a type Boolean. Uh, and it's going to take a vector to int direction. I think that's right. We might need to change this. Uh, we might need to, we might need to move this into like a, a can move function. We need some kind of can move. Check ahead of us, see if we can move. So let's do that. Let's move. Let's not have this do double duty. Let's write. We're gonna write a function that see if we can move in our direction. I am being inconsistent with my naming. There we go. Uh, we were gonna write we're gonna write a function that will check if we can move. And we'll just have that logic be there. It just tells us true or false. Uh, so we'll check to see if there's some obstacle in front of it. If there is, we don't move. So move once. Uh, if we can move. Uh, If we can move in direction, we take our position uh, and this is a vector 2 int and this is a vector 3 so we need to turn it into a vector 3. So we take our position, we take our current position and we add our direction dot x, our direction dot y and zero and that will turn now we have a vector three that's basically the same x and y values as direction there's another way to do that called casting but we can write it out get a little let's get some time to write that um and then if we can move in that direction we teleport ourselves and then after we're done moving here's the fun part we call this function again Weird. So this function will move us and then it'll do it again. <laughs> and then it'll move us and then it'll do it again. And it'll do it forever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, this is created an infinite, you know, this returns true for now. This has created an infinite loop. Uh, this is called a recursive function. It's a function that calls itself. Recursive functions are famous for giving ourselves infinite loops. But it's also how we do, uh, it's a gateway to a lot of really fun advanced programming features like um, uh, 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 like flood fill algorithms and pathfinding and things where you just, you just keep doing this like algorithmic process over and over again by calling it. Um, it's very fun. So uh, our, our, our example of a, of a thing is, is pretty simple, but um, we're going to check for pickups. Uh, spawn dust trail B and spawn our dust trail and then move us and then check for pickups at, at new location. We'll just put some comments there for now as placeholders. Uh, how am I at? 30 minutes? Yeah, we're on time. We're on, pro we're on progress. Going a little slow, but we're on progress. Um, all right. We need to check if we can move in a direction. How do we do that? We're going to use the physics 2D system which has lots of fun functions and properties that we can use. So what are those? Um, uh, uh, we have tons of information we can get, but if we check our methods, um, we have things like cast a, cur a circle against colliders in the scene, returning the first collider to contact with it. Uh, uh, we have things like that where we can just check we can just check up the position in the world, like uh, 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 overlap point is, is I think the one I want to use. Um, where are you? Where is it? Close to the point? No. Point. point. Overlap point. Uh, check if a collider overlaps a point. No, that's checking the collider. Oh, yeah. We, we see if there is any collider at a location. 
right? So we're just going to check, uh, if we were drawing that point in front of us, we're just gonna check, is there anything here? <laughs> and if there is not, then we'll move into that position. So uh, we could check a circle, we could check a square, but because we're on a grid, everything, any collider shape we have, circles, squares, whatever, as long as it like, over, as long as that collider shape overlaps the center of its of its like location, this function will work. Um, so we're going to use it. We could we could do circle, but I think point is slightly more performant. So uh, we take we give it a point. We have a layer mask. Ooh, what's that? That's fun. Uh, and an optional min and max depth, uh, and that returns a collider two D. It will return null if we don't hit anything. So overlap point. We need to give it a position, uh, vector two, and we have a direction. We need to do this thing again. Um, uh, and if we need to do it more than once, we might as well only do it once. Uh, vector three next. Position equals. Uh, we do it once in next position, and then we, when we do move, we just set ourselves into that position. And instead of checking if we can move in a direction, we can check uh, vector three point. Yeah, sure. Why not? We can do whatever. I don't, I don't want to. I don't like doing things like this more than once. <laughs> I want to save it into a variable. So now I'm kind of changing up my code to to make to make life uh, just amenable. So I check a position. If I can move to that position, do, 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 then I will literally just teleport myself to that position. Um, so now I changed can move instead of it taking a direction, it's taking a a world point. Um, taking a, a point in world space. I'll change my variable name to reflect that. Uh, and it's a vector three now that is going into my function. We should be pretty comfortable writing functions with parameters at this point. Uh, but now I have a point that I can just pass in there. Uh, it gets turned into a vector two. That's, should that be a vector two? I guess it doesn't matter because it'll either get cast to a, from a three to a two here or it'll get cast from a vector three to a vector two here. Either way, we're gonna lose the Z position. I don't care, it doesn't make a difference. Um, and now a layer mask. Ooh, what's a layer mask? Layer mask, layer mask, what's a layer mask? Uh, the easiest way to explain a layer mask is if we make a, if we make one, uh, and let's call, let's make a private layer mask and let's call it environment layer mask. Um, and if we go back into Unity, go to the player, and we give them a player movement script, we give them a player input script, um, it's uh, not apparent because I have bugs in my code. Where's my bugs? This line is giving me bugs. Now I can compile successfully, then Unity will update the inspector. Um, this dropdown list is a dropdown list of layers. Right, all the layers in my scene. Um, the word mask is coming from a concept called a bit mask. So uh, what's very interesting about this is it, it actually asked for an integer. Uh, it, the layer mask it is, is an integer. It's a number. Uh, and the number is stored in binary. Uh, but what's happening uh, is instead of re representing a number, like whatever this number is, um, go watch the video on binary to, to see that. Uh, this represents the default layer. This represents the everything layer. This represents the water layer. This represents the whatever layer. This bit represents the whatever layer. And if it's one or a zero, it means yes for that layer or no for that layer. Uh, so if it's comparing the layers of objects it's very easy to say to like look for the bit that is the same or different uh, using some clever some, some clever um, binary processes. So it's very clever, um, but figuring out what that integer is manually sucks. It's annoying. 
Uh, but giving ourselves a little drop down in the Unity Inspector where I can choose what layer uh, what layer I'm on. Let's say everything, zero, one, 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 you know. Uh, that's very easy and that's really nice to do. So I like to use layer masks um, by just serializing them and then just moving on with my life. Um, layer mask. Uh, so, and I think that's all we can get, we can give it. We have optional min and max like Z positions that we could be using. Um, min uh, if wall is null. If there is no wall at this point, there is no uh, nothing on this layer, no collider component that is on that layer, uh, then we will make this entire function be true. Otherwise, we will make it false. There's, a, there's an easier way to write that. This is true or false, <laughs> right? If true, then true, else if false, return false. We can actually just return we can return that. Neat. Because this is a Boolean that will be true when our wall is empty and it will be false when our wall is not empty. Our variable. And that's 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 what we want. So we can write it out as a as an if statement like this. I'll leave it like that because that's a little bit easier to read if you're just getting started with, with programming. Um, but honestly, this is stupid code. <laughs> uh, because we're you know, if true, return true. If false, return false. Like, why not just return the, con the same conditional we're checking? Um, okay. So let's try it. We have a, we have a, you know, we could have a, a, a bug. And our bug right now is that <laughs> there's no colliders in the scene. There's no colliders in the scene. All right, if we hit the code and we tried to move, it would immediately be an infinite loop error. There's no colliders in the scene. Um, so when we're doing a recursive function, let's add a second property. Let's call it, uh, not break, let's in, uh, int, int, uh, in too many moves. <laughs> um, if too many moves is greater than 100, we'll never have a level more than 100, 1,000. We'll never have a level that big. It'll never be that large. We'll never move uh, uh, that many grid spaces in a row. Uh, we'll just we'll just return. We'll just you know bail. <laughs> we'll stop doing this potential infinite loop function. Um, and when we call the potential infinite loop function, we'll take we're gonna give it too many moves plus one. So the first time we call this function, we're gonna move, um, it'll be, we'll have this equal to zero. The second time that number will be one. The third time that number will be two. And if it ever gets this big, it'll end. It won't crash the game. Nice. Uh, so move once in our actual move function that starts everything. Um, I like to keep a potential game breaking recursive functions private and nice polite functions that can check for some, you know, some common use cases uh, that we don't need to check for recursively, like like valid input or something, um, uh, public, and uh, do some do some sanitizer input, and then and then do the dangerous stuff. So, in this case, we're just going to pass it right in, like that direction, and that will be zero. Um, we can set that equal to zero by default. Oh, we're getting fancy. Oh my gosh, default properties. We didn't learn about that. We hadn't. We're, we're, we'll set that equal to zero. Ooh. Oh, I almost showed you something cool. Can't have that. <laughs> okay, uh, so we call the move function. We sanitize input if direction not, uh, not equal to I don't know whatever blah 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 to do <laughs> to do sanitize our input. Okay, uh, then we move in that direction and then move once. Move once will just continue. It, it won't move once. That's actually a bad name, right? Move once. Uh, uh, let's rename it to maybe move once recursive. Move once recursive. Okay. Uh, still not a good name. <laughs> does it move once or does it move forever? I don't know. Uh, but now we'll have too many moves. Debug.log error. 
too many rooms. Okay. Uh, let's see if it works. So first, let's check. Uh, let's potentially break the game. Uh, and we'll see if we can get it too many moves here. No, let's 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 fix our tile map. Okay. Uh, we need colliders on all of these shapes. Whew. Tile map collider. It creates a collision shape uh, just by, in this case, stamping squares down on everything. Um, we can put ourselves on a default layer. And the player can collide with everything, and that's fine for now. We'll have to probably make an environment layer. layer. But let's test it. Hey, they moved. <laughs> okay, hold on. My, my, my game view is... Uh, main camera, orthographic size, bigger. Okay, let's test it. <laughs> we can move. And now, if you're a little bit confused about the gameplay and the puzzle of the game, now it's kind of starting to make sense, right? We're, you know, we're doing stuff. Um... Okay. Neat. Let's, what do we got here? What is on our to-do list? Player movement. Um, remove, what happens if we're right next to something on the first move? It shouldn't let us do that, right? Because we're checking can move before we even begin moving. Great. Fun. Okay. Um, I think I want to end part one, but maybe we should do the uh, item pickups. Well, if we can't do item pickups really until we do the health stuff, so. Um, instead, we'll just put our placeholder code. Spawn dust trail. Spawn dust trail at transform.position. Hey, that function doesn't exist. Make it for me. Thank you. Private void spawn dust trail. World location. And you spawn a little thing. Uh, how about check for overlaps? Let's move that into its own function. Check for uh, collections. At, uh, well, here we are. Our position that we just changed, right? So this is a new position now. Check for hiccups. Um, so I have my cursor over it. I hit Alt Enter. Uh, and then writer tells me, can you, do you want me to make this method for you? And I do. <laughs> um, hey, we haven't implemented it. We haven't written the code yet. While you see these little boxes in writer, that means I can hit tab and it'll, actually I messed it up. Um, I can hit tab and it will let me like cycle through. Normal position, hit tab, delete that code. To do, check over that. And grab a thing here. So, there we go. So now we got some placeholder code. We got some functions where we can implement the things we want to implement for our game, and that's nice. That's a nice thing to do, right? Um, it's just this will do its job. This will do its job. Right. Let's make the dust trail. Uh, particle systems. No, that's too much to do. We could do animation manually. That seems annoying. We could use the animation system. That feels like a lot of setup, but eventually the way to do it. Particle systems? At 45 minutes, I want to keep part. I want to keep each video part in an hour, so I have to decide right now how we're going to do it. It's been a minute since I've touched a particle system. 
Uh, yeah, let's do particle systems. Let's make a new empty. Let's call it dust. Uh, and let's add a particle system. That's a component. Oh, look at that. Okay. Uh, it's going to spawn. It's, it's actually kind of what I want. I just want it to be like smaller and faster, like a little poof. Um, so our duration, uh, the length of time the particle is emitting, uh, uh, well, it'll be forever. Um, so let's stop it. And our duration currently is five. I don't want that. I want it to be like 0 0.1. Okay. Uh, 0 0.2. Let's add a particle. Um, let's have the start size be very small. Yeah. Little. I'm gonna turn looping on. Just nope. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't want to rotate it. I kind of just like squares is fine for now. This like really isn't important. Um, emission rate over time ten. How about a hundred? Nice shape. That's our particle shape. Um, so we'll do one. Smaller. Uh, box. We're in box, right? I have a truck again. I'm sorry. We're going to pause. And I'm back. And I that took like 10 minutes. So I completely lost my train of thought. Uh, particle systems. Hey, what do all these things do? I, just just play. Just play with it. <laughs> if you hover your mouse over them, you can figure it out. Uh, but the system is, uh, it, it, they spawn uh, uh, highly performant little objects in memory that we can render that your, your particles. Okay, I need them to last not as long. Um, that is their lifetime. So how about one? How about 0 0.5? 0 0.25? 0 0.5? Uh, and if they're not, we, we can have less of them maybe. And then I want them to be moving extremely fast. Um, so speed, double that. Let's just call that okay for now. Uh, you'll notice they're pink. There's a whole editor in. Um, there's a whole editor that lets you do fun stuff with particle systems, but um, uh, they're pink because of the the renderer. They don't have a material, um, so let's just give them the a default particle material, which I feel like it should be. Actually, that's just like a very gradient circle. Let's give it um, default sprite material. That'll, make, that'll look square and our game is square. We'll need to redo all that when we do graphics later, but it's fine. Okay. Uh, and then now we can create a prefab. No, create a folder. <laughs> Call it prefabs. And then now create a prefab out of our particle system here. Drag and drop. Go to that. Delete the instance from the scene. I already have it. It's all saved. Let's go to the player movement. And let's... Make a private game object dust particles dust trail prefab. My code doesn't care if it's a particle system or not. Dust trail prefab. And then uh, spawn dust trail. We will instantiate dust trail prefab at our world uh, at our world location at our standard rotation at our own rotation which we never rotate do we i guess a 
detect dust field particle twice. World location. I'm going crazy. Same object, vector three, quaternion. There we go. Um, let's test. Let's actually remember to drag and drop that into the slot. So that's cool, um, but this isn't. Uh, so let's go back to our prefab and let's change. There's a setting here to uh, have the particle system destroy itself on when it's done. Um, somewhere, where is it? It's been a minute since I've touched Um, stop action. Disable, destroy, destroy. If we're using an object pooler, we can change this to disable. But we're not, I'm not going to write an object pooler right now. All right, let's do a few more things. Let's change that color to be greenish. And then let's change color over lifetime to start green and end green. Alpha, so I don't want that. I want alpha over lifetime quaternion. Maybe I can't because of the sprite I'm using doesn't support transparency. How about size over lifetime? We'll make it shrink. Uh, uh, start big and small. Start big and small. Oh, it's underneath my face. Ah, oh. <laughs> um, size over lifetime. We'll turn off color over lifetime. Size over lifetime. Uh, start big. Scale down to zero over its life. There we go. That's better. Um, and I, later I made the earlier I made the ring very small, but I think I'm gonna make that ring bigger. So that is its emission shape. Uh, that Place where it can, the particles can be created. Okay. I'm getting. I don't care about particle. I don't care about the particles. <laughs> we can. Uh, you know, we might want to give them a direction. Like, there's a lot, but that's the game design stuff, right? That's like we're gonna we're gonna worry about them in the future. I just you know, it's a little little flash preview of particles. Uh, let's do pickups. Um, let's do pickups, and we're gonna call this pickup, uh, and we're gonna give it a, a collider. We need a collider, and here we want to worry about our layers. So we now we need to go to our project settings. Because right now, this will act like an environment and it won't let us hit the pickup. So we need to have a layer for our pickups. And I'm going to move our D, our, another layer for our environment so we're not using default. Uh, so we're going to make an environment layer and we're going to make a interactables. Because I can use the same layer for when I reach the exit. And I can use the same layer for when I do something else. Interactables. Uh, sure. Make it, make it blue. Um, layer, interactables. And our tile map, change the layer to environment. And then on our player, player movement will collide with the environment layer and everything else. Why not? Just in case I forgot to do the other part. Uh, okay. Uh, we'll collide with the environment. Um, 
So now we're gonna copy and paste some code. I've used the word world position, world location, and world point. That's bad. Let's be consistent. Let's say world point. <laughs> if you're copying along with my code word for word, line by line, uh, you're probably going to be annoyed by that. But guess what? Deal with it. Because uh, learning what things that you can just change freely that doesn't affect the logic, like variable names versus the things that we super care about, like our types, that's a good thing to kind of have to keep straight. Um, pickups, and we're going to overlap a world point and pick up layer mask, doesn't exist. Let's make one. Interactable layer mask. Copy and pasted. So uh, I'll check if I pick up anything. World point. Directable layer mask if pickups is not equal to null. Uh, we'll just delete it <laughs> for now. Uh, pick up the object. Interact with the object. Um, We'll delete it for now just to test if the if this code is getting the correct position and everything is happening correctly for it. And then we're gonna write some fun, some fun, uh, some game logic stuff. Uh, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because I go to the player and I need to change its layer from nothing to interactables. Uh, and it worked. We collected something. But what does it do? I don't know. <laughs> so we're going to write a new uh, script. We're going to call it pickups. Mm. We're going to call it interactable. We call it interactable. And we're going to make public interact and this object will destroy itself now we're going to put this interactable script on our pickup object interactable uh, that's underneath me I, but it's it's there <laughs> I put I put it there um, so now our player movement I don't want to control I don't I don't the player movement shouldn't be responsible for checking if we're at the exit or if we picked up an object or what the player movement code doesn't deal with that instead it's going to uh, take that interactable uh, type and it, well first it's going to see if it can it's going to get a reference to the interactable type on the thing we're picking up uh, interactable Interactable equals pickups. Pickups is pick up. Pick up. Uh, the rear, um, uh, we'll call this overlap. Cause it's like the collider shape. Uh, get component interactable. And then we have to check if interactable uh, is null debug.log morning and we're going to say okay I uh, forgot to put interactable component on an interactable layer item um, else but like at that point this is actually an error um, like that should never happen in our code so I'm not going to uh, interactable which is a reference to the interactable script, that component, on the pick object we're picking up, scheme object. Uh, and we're going to write a interactable dot interact function. Neat. Neat, neat, neat. Uh, so, and then this function is going to destroy the game object. 
Uh, it's going to do whatever, and then it's going to destroy the game object. Uh, so the player movement code no longer knows anything about how the interactables work. It just checks for them and moves on. I called it check for pickups. I'm going to rename this function to check for interactable. Shift, click on the thing, shift F6 and writer to rename. Checking for interactable. And I'm at time for the video, and I think that's all right. But that was what we wanted to get done. We wanted player movement, and we wanted some of the bones for part two of the video. So uh, this video is going up, and the code that I wrote is also going up for you to use as a reference point for like your progress, right? Um, but let's review it here just to take a look at what we're doing. Um, the main code we wrote so far is player movement, so let's do that one last. Um, interactable is any object that can be interacted with, and when it's interacted with, gets told it's interacted with, and it does what it does internally. And it deals with itself, but it doesn't know when or how anything's happening. It just gets has this public function that tells it when to do something. Player input uh, takes all of our input from our key codes, uh, which was the fastest thing to type, because uh, I didn't want to jump over to Unity and open the input system and make a bunch of axes and buttons and stuff. But uh, we're getting our key downs, and we're checking, uh, and then we're calling the move function on the player. Player movement, or the player has a nifty move script which will sanitize our input and deal with anything from the outside world and then call it dangerous and it needs to know this internal workings, so uh, its own internal dangerous move function. I say dangerous because this function is recursive. It calls itself and will potentially have an infinite loop forever and ever and ever. To avoid having this function have an infinite loop, we give it a property called too many moves uh, too many calls, too many loops, break condition, whatever it is. Uh, and if we move a thousand times, we will bail. We haven't tested that yet. We should test that. Um, but not right now. Uh, what the function actually does is it sees if we can move, and if we can move, it moves us, and then it tries again. And it will see if we can move, and if we can, and then we move, and then it tries again, and so on, until can move is false, and we it just ends. And there's no more recursive looping function calls. Before we move, we spawn a dust trail at our current position. Then we move, and then we check if we overlap something at our current position right after we moved. Uh, and then we, we try again. Um, because I'm using this next position in multiple locations, um, I stored it in a variable. But it's basically taking our direction and adding it to our transform. This is assuming our grid has a size of 1, Seems fine for me, you know. We can make a public float grid size and we can change that value. But I think for until we need to, we should just leave it as is. A grid size of one uh, is a fair enough assumption. So my direction is not just my direction, but it is also my distance. Uh, our checking for our interactable code just uses the same physics that overlap uh, function that we used a number of times. We checked if we can move, also using it. Um, and this function, the only tricky part is that it uses a layer mask, and we had to learn what layer masks are, which are integers, and they're very annoying to work with unless you let the Unity editor do the hard part, in which case they're very easy to work with. Those are the layers that, from that drop-down list, I can choose multiple from that I will be checking to find colliders at this point. At what point, this function doesn't care, it gets told. Um, and for interactables, uh, well, the easier one for can move, we just, if we have something here on that layer, we can't move. Can, we can not move. Function isn't very good. It should be like check for wall because we're giving it the wall position, we're not checking its direction. So can move isn't a very good name anymore. When we wrote it, I was, we were thinking we were gonna use direction, but now we're sampling world coordinates, so we should be like, is wall here? Or is no wall here? Is no wall here? Which is like a double, double negative, uh, but changing it to a double, like the, means I don't have to change my code to make this flip the true and false so that the name makes sense and then go up here and add the exclamation point or the bang to flip it. You get it. You, right. 
what is what is does true mean we can move or does false mean we can move? Well, is wall here would be a better function than is no wall here because the double, you got to flip the negative in your head. But true means I can move. Is no wall here? <laughs> is free of environment? Okay. I kind of want to change. Okay, it's fine. Uh, Checking for interactable. Um, we take our world location, our world position, our world destination, our world point, whatever we called it. World point. We check if we have anything on the interactable layer. Um, if we do have something on the interactable layer, we are not equal to null. Then we will find get the component reference to the interactable component, and we will call that function with a little safety net to make sure our game doesn't crash in this if else statement. Um, the quick way, I guess we should probably flip that. Um, just so in an if statement, your important logic comes first, and then your thing you don't care about, you care about less, is in the else statement. So I could get rid of the else statement, and my game would still work, as opposed to getting rid of the other part. Whatever. A little bit easier to read if you write it like this, because it's like, what I'm actually doing here, what I care about, is I read it from top down. The first thing is the thing I care about. I read it first, understand it, and go, oh, and then, yeah, an error. Okay. Uh, and then we spawned a particle system and we made particle systems, but this video is not about particle systems and you can maybe don't, <laughs> maybe you just, maybe this one's just like a, eh, we'll get to that one in the future. I don't care about particle systems right now. Uh, that, and that's our game. Let's test that the in breaking the infinite loop worked. Let's like, let's go forever. Uh, what we should see, if this goes wrong, if I hit the right arrow key and my player moves forever, um, uh, uh, my Unity will crash, probably. It did not crash. It spawned a thousand <laughs> particle systems, but then it gave me this error, too many moves. I wrote that error myself, uh, and, and, and the editor has not crashed. So congratulations, our breakpoint saved us from that potential problem. Um, and that's, that's the end of part one. So the code will be up. Uh, you got up to this point in the video. Um, you got lost or something broke or you got a namespace issue and it all, you can never fix it and you, you got super confused and I kept moving because you forgot the pause feature exists and everything was chaos. Um, that's okay. Check my code, compare it, do the debugging. That's on you. You got to fix that and we'll get caught up. Um, but get caught up to this point where you have the player moving around uh, and checking for the positions and stuff uh, before we get to part two, which I'm about to record immediately, but you, you are going to make sure you're ready to go. So see you in a bit.